if anyone who's not here with us uh, has any problems with the, this interface, uh, go to the web page of the conference and you'll see that there is also another possibility of watching it on YouTube. If there's a, a little delay, uh, there is no way you can uh, then uh, talk on the chat. So, so that's why we prefer this, uh, this interface here. Well, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our special international guest, uh, Robert uh, Davison. Uh, many of, of you surely uh, know him from his editorial work. He's been the editor of some of the most prestigious uh, journals in our area. Uh, uh, and uh, he also, and, and in fact, although some of those are really impressive, are some of the best journals in, in, in the area, uh, one that I'm really keen on is the, the one on developing countries. Uh, I guess in developing countries. Uh, and uh, so this is maybe uh, where we, have, we could be more interested. So uh, Robert uh, will give us a little bit of his experience on how we presidents could probably make, make some impact on, or, or, or get into, uh, into the international uh, community uh, more effectively than we do. So, and thank you very much. Thank you. I will leave you there. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, it's interesting you introduced me to the British. I'm not sure I am. Uh, I lived in Hong Kong for 22 years, so I think I'm at least half Chinese. Um, and in Hong Kong, if you come 15 minutes late, you're still on screen. So 10 minutes late is not a problem for us at all. Of course, in some parts of Europe, you start, you come five seconds late, you're late. And they won't wait for you. Be careful in the Netherlands or Germany. Um, now, I would like to talk about, as you said, how Brazilian IS researchers could make an impact. Um, I think it's an interesting topic because um, making an impact is very important. And I, I don't think that. How would you know if the research makes an impact or not? How would you know if anyone needs it? How would you know if anyone cites it? I mean, there are citation indexes, and we can count how many times a paper is downloaded. So that could be one way of looking at it. But still, we have to do the research in the first place before we can look at the impact. So that's something to look at here. Now, roughly, this is what I intend to cover. Uh, some introduction to. Maybe I should stand here. So, yeah, so I'm to, to, yeah, I like to walk around. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I, I will disappear. Oh, my horses. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So these are the topics I intend to look at, uh, rigor, relevance, but also context, and see how the research we do has a context and why that context is important. I want to look at Brazil, but I also want to look at China, because I know China much better. And I will give you some examples from China, and I'm hoping you can find examples from Brazil about the Brazilian context, which we can identify, which are new, which are interesting, because it's much easier to publish new things. It's much easier to publish interesting things. If you just repeat what someone else has done, it's much harder to publish. You need to look at theory, because most highest research journals will ask, where is the theory? We don't have one. And so theory is something that's important. I will look at journals and editors. Because in order to publish, you have to understand what journals are looking for, what editors are looking for. Because if you don't, you'll have to give them something they don't want. But you need to know what they want. And this means understanding the publishing process, but also understanding yourself. Because most authors don't think about the publishing process except 
I want to publish. And don't think about who's going to read the research. But you should do it. Because if no one reads it, why should they publish it? So you have to put yourself in the position of the editor or the reviewer or the reader to understand what they might find useful. Um, I'll have a brief look at some topics and processes and then something about research planning. The last part, the workshops, uh, so I turn around because normally the slides are here and I don't have them here. So. Um, workshops is something, an idea about how journals and authors can come together. Not just we write the paper and we send the paper, but there is a, a workshop where both sides can sit down together. And this is something that we do see in conferences sometimes, and it will happen in ESIS, for example. Okay. Um, to me, relevance is very important. But most journals tend to look at rigor. Rigor is doing the right things in the right way. Have you applied the right method? Have you got the right theory? Have you analyzed your data correctly? And they focus everything on rigor. And if it's well done, then maybe you can publish it. Unfortunately, there is also relevance. And to me, relevance is who is it useful for? Who is the research family or useful or relevant for? Um, and this is something that I think we need to pay more attention to. And perhaps particularly in Brazil or other countries. Anybody can do good research. But can you make your research interesting? Can you make your research relevant for some people who would find it interesting and useful to read? Um, so relevance is something I will talk about. And to be relevant, you have to have a context. You have to identify what is the context I'm writing about. What is the context where the research is being done? What kind of people are these? What kind of problem is this? And then, how am I doing something useful for those people? And so, to me, the context is critical. And a lot of research does not identify the context. They say, we collected data from a company, but they never say where. And we tested this theory, but they don't say who the people are. And when you finish reading the article, they've done a very good job, but I don't know what about. Because I don't know who they studied, and I don't know where it was, and I don't know what the culture was. Because they never said it. And to me, that's a problem. And as an editor, when I read papers which are submitted to journals, I often send the paper back and I say, I need more context. If you don't tell me the context, I don't know how to read the paper. So, for example, yesterday I read a paper which was submitted to the Information Systems Journal by some researchers in Canada. And they were describing how doctors rely on their emotions for IT based decision making. I thought that was very interesting, an in, in emotional aspect. But they never said where they studied, they never said it was in Canada. I would imagine that people in Canada have one kind of emotion which is different from people in China, or people in Japan, or people somewhere else. I know there are studies of emotion in China. And Chinese emotions may be different. But if you don't tell where is the context, you don't know what they're studying. And so being explicit about the context can be helpful. Yesterday, talking to Ricardo, about your thesis, and, and you were saying, maybe we do things differently in Brazil. Yeah, I'm sure we do. And those different things are interesting. But if you write a paper, and the word Brazil never appears in the paper, who knows? So I think you need to be a little bit explicit about the context and the people and the nature of, this is why I ask you, who are the 14 people? We need to know a little bit more about who are people that we're studying in order to make sense of the research. If I know more about the context, I can make more sense as a reader. Um, yeah. If you look at Brazil as a context, 
You're the experts, not me. But I'm sure there are special things about Brazil, about the culture, about behavior, about organizations, about decision making, about IT, about e commerce, about social media. Brazil is a big country, it has, it has a culture. Surely the culture will have an impact on some aspects of how is IT used or developed or applied by individuals, by teams, by organizations. The, the, the simple question is, what do you do? What do you do that's different? How do you do it? If you read the literature, you may be familiar with how do people do it in other countries. But then you must compare to yourself, how do we do it? And, and why do we do it this way? And so I, I like to ask these how and why questions. How do you do something and why is it like that? As a way of trying to dig deeper to understand how people think how people behave, and why they think in this way. What is the underlying reason? Because if we can identify those things, we can write about them, but we can also ask, is that relevant in other places? If we don't ask this question, then we're saying the Brazilian way is universal. Everything that happens in Brazil also happens in America, also happens in Germany, also happens in China. It's not believable. It's unlikely. And of course, the Americans do this all the time. The Americans always assume that what's good for them is good for everybody else. And we know that's not true. eBay is famous for being a very successful e-commerce company. But eBay failed in China. They were picked out. There are Chinese online markets which are very, very successful. And eBay is not one of them. They tried and they failed dramatically. They lost <laughs> a lot of money. They lost a lot of face because they didn't understand the Chinese culture. So eBay, yeah, it seems good that there are some limitations. Amazon the same. They are these are American companies, but they are not universal. The way they do business is not universal. In China, it's different. In Japan, it's different. So we need to identify something about Brazil. And mm -hmm. think about how we test those ideas in other places. Now, I said I would talk about China, because I know China much better. And a key word in China is Guanxi. The first word of the second word is Jiyue and Xi. Wangxi roughly means relationships. More accurately, Wangxi is very close mutual relationships with mutual dependence, mutual obligation. If I help you, you will help me. Maybe not today, maybe 20 years later. It's a very, very long term relationship. If I don't have these relationships, it's almost impossible to work. By asking for help, and you don't have a relationship, you won't help me. You won't feel the obligation. And so, in the Chinese context, obligation is very powerful. The, the, the responsibility to work with other people. So if I study things in China, I have to look at this. If I study decision making, or resource allocation, or supply chains, or logistics, it's unlikely it's purely computer based at some level, people are involved. And then people are involved, relationships are involved. And so when I look at, for example, knowledge management in China, I, I have a problem. I need to get some knowledge. And I ask people, if they know me, maybe they'll help. If they don't know me, they won't. It's not worth it, no. If, if I know someone and she, she doesn't know the answer, she may ask her friends, but they may tell her and she may tell me. That can still work. If I ask the friends directly, nothing. So the initial contact is very important. It's Chinese, okay. But is this concept valid outside China? 
we have to test, we have to find out, we have to go and study other people. I was in Australia two years ago talking about this concept to Australian professors. And one professor said, actually, in Australia, it's similar. For people, particularly in the countryside, the relationships are very, very strong. They will, if I know you, I will give you a job, even though you're not qualified. It may be illegal, but I'll do it. And so the sense of obligation in relationships can be very strong. Maybe not in the city, because the law is stronger, the police are stronger in the city. In the countryside, they do what they like. Um, also, the Aboriginal people have a very strong sense of relationship. Um, and so I, I don't think, although the word Banshi is Chinese, I don't think it's limited to China. I don't think the concept is limited to China. We could look at Banshi in other countries. So, I would also think there should be some Brazilian things we could identify, and we could test those ideas. We could measure those things in other cultures and see if they work in the same way or not. And that would be interesting. That's publishing. But you have to find them. I don't know what they are. But I have published papers on Guanxi in top IS journals, so I know it's possible. I have a paper this March in MIS quarterly. I have a paper last year in the Information Systems Journal. So these journals will publish Chinese concepts. Then they should also publish Brazilian concepts. <coughs> So what is it? It is you need to put something up the slides. Maybe it was me. But some of you can so I think there should be something Brazilian that is interesting, that is unique, that we could identify, we could write about, and we could perhaps look for in other cultures. Certainly in Chinese I can do this. Um, and identifying these kinds of questions is important for the starting point. Because if you want to do research and publish research, you have to have a good research question. You have to motivate the research in a way that is meaningful for other people. Um, you have to show that the research topic is interesting. Because interesting research is much easier to publish. Boring research is much harder because nobody's interested. And, that, and that's a very simple thing to say. But so many people do boring research. Most good journals reject 90%. Why? Badly done and boring are two good reasons why. If it's not interesting, we're not going to publish it. Send to a conference, maybe the conference works. If this is conference, I'm sure it's very high quality. <laughs> <laughs> now, here are two examples about context, which I saw as an editor recently. Two, these were two different papers submitted to the Information Systems Journal. And I changed it a little bit, but basically this is the summary of these two papers. In the absence of real executives, real decision makers, we collected data from senior business managers in the mid-Atlantic University. That's what we all wrote. I don't know what that means. Where, where, where is the mid-Atlantic? Ricardo, where is the mid-Atlantic? Maybe it's St. Helena or it's Tristan de Cunha or something like that. If you, if you know America, if you know the US, the Mid-Atlantic is a very particular expression in the US, which means somewhere between North Carolina and New York. That is the Mid-Atlantic. But only Americans would know this. English would not know this. Chinese would not know this. Um, so that's what they mean by Mid-Atlantic. And of course, it's normal. They, they can't find real people, so they have to study students. In fact, students are real people, but they're just not. <laughs> not, not so interesting. So who are these people? Where are they? Why did they study these people? What for? Who knows? There's no context here. Mid-Atlantic is not useful. It doesn't mean anything to me. The second example is worse. To test the hypotheses, we surveyed employees a 
as a large engineering company in the southwest. About uh, using ERP systems. Southwest, that's all we know. Southwest, southwest of where? Southwest of Brazil? Southwest of Iceland? Southwest of Antarctica? It, it doesn't say. Now, and, and this is common. You can read articles where they say they study people in the southwest. They say it tells you nothing. Now, Sorry. San Diego. It's, it's a San Diego. Maybe. Maybe it's San Diego, yes. Or, or, or Tucson, or Phoenix. Maybe this is deliberate as a way of making the reviewers think that it's southwest of the US. They didn't say that, but they're giving the impression that it's southwest of the US. And they think that the reviewers will be American. And therefore, won't be And they think that the reviewers will think, well, that's okay, no problem. So I went back to the author. I know who the authors are. Guess which country the authors are? India. Now, it's possible that Indian authors would write about the southwest of the US, but it's unlikely. It's more likely they write about the southwest of India. And they did, because I asked them. I said, why didn't you say which country? We, we thought that nobody would be interested in which country. Or worse, we thought nobody wanted to know that it was India. We thought no one's interested in India. Then why did you send a paper? Well, because it doesn't matter. Because the country is unimportant. Then why did you say Southwest? Well, because we thought people might think it was American. <laughs> That's honest. <laughs> But it's also very deceitful because you're creating the impression of one country when you know it's actually somewhere else. You're hoping the reviewers are more sympathetic to the US, and you're assuming the reviewers are less sympathetic to India. Actually, for me, India is more interesting because we have very few papers about India. We have far too many about the US. And so a study about India and ERP systems could be quite interesting. However, in the paper, all of the theory, all of the questions are standard Western theory, Western research instrument. There's nothing Indian here at all. There's nothing about India. None of the questions are about Indian culture. None of the questions are about Indian context or Indian problems. But for example, in India, power supply is a big problem. You cannot be sure your system will run every day because the electricity may turn off. You have a blackout or a brownout. In the day. Today there is no electricity. Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. That's a real problem in India. They could ask you about that. That could have an impact on ERP system use. But they never ask. They just say, is it useful? Is it friendly? Is it usable? Does it have value? Standard questions. So actually, we learn nothing about India. We only learn about what's been studied already, and maybe the data is Indian, but there's nothing new here. Um, I have a different example, and this example was published recently in the Information Systems Journal, and oh, the slides have jumped. Yeah. Who jumped the slides? It's an experiment. But the problem is everyone has a synchronized button there. Please do not synchronize it. This is from Denmark. I thought we published earlier this year. And it's about how people use, in this case, iPhones. And the relationships they develop with their iPhones. And they call this time out, time in. Time in is when you are using your iPhone, and time out is when you're not using your iPhone. Why is this so special? These people use iPhone 24 hours a day. They are heavy users. Um, these kinds of IT artifacts we call experiential computing because they are so close to us that we're using them all the time. Um, the quotation from you, you 2010. Humans no longer experience computing is something out there. Computing is part of us. You should see this with teenagers. You probably see this with your children. They are addicted 
to telecommunications. Um, who is surprising you? <laughs> <laughs> there is a button that synchronizes the issues very often. Um, and in order to do this research, they have nothing to do with um, they did, oh, just not first. Mm -hmm. they did a field study with some postgraduate students and they interviewed them, they did surveys, they did some focus groups to learn how do these students use the technology. And they identified these three stages and have love affairs with the technology. When they first meet the iPhone, they fall in love with the iPhone. With the words they use. It's like a romance. And later they get married to the iPhone and it becomes very stable. And they make grow old together as they become more familiar. So they're comparing human life relationships with iPhone relationships. That's different. That's a different way of presenting the ideas. Of course people don't just have one phone. They have two phones or three phones. So they have extramarital affairs. Because here is the one, but I'm actually also using other ones. And sometimes they lose their phone. And you can imagine what that might be in human terms. Or they uh, get divorced from their phone. Because at the end of the study, they had to return the phones. And forcing the students to return the phones was very painful. Because they got married and had a relationship with these phones, and they were part of their life. And then they study over, please give the phone back, and they were forced to cut. So they just had some different ideas about how do people form relationships with technology. Technology is not just a thing, it's, it's part of you. It may not be so true for people of this generation. For your children, I think it may be more true. Because for people who we call digital natives, the technology is just who they are. When I teach in Hong Kong, most of my students are in their twenties. And in the first class last year, at the end of the class, I asked the students, I had 45 students, who did not use their iPhone during this class? Everybody has been doing something online whilst I'm talking. Whether it's checking instant messaging, checking Facebook, checking Twitter, checking I don't know what. Well, why? Well, what's the big deal? Like, this is more interesting than me. Yes, definitely. They <laughs> <laughs> say F O M O. No, F O M O. Fear of missing out. So their life is an online life. Facebook is part of their brain, part of their personality. If you cut them off, they feel extremely uncomfortable. So, but we need to study this. And I wonder about Brazil. How do Brazilian teenagers and Brazilian 20-something use technology, adapt to technology, bring technology into the workplace? Does the company allow? You, you, they go and work for a company, does the company allow them to access technology at work or they block it? They have Wi-Fi access or nothing? I, I don't know. But these are questions you could ask. And I guess Brazil will have a culture, a, a technology culture, a, 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 a Rec2 culture, a social media culture, that could be interesting to study and to compare. And to look at not just what do teenagers do, but what do people do at work. Some companies may say, yeah, good idea, let's do it, because we have lots of sharing, lots of integration, lots of brainstorming. Other organizations, no, this is this is stuff for chatting. Chatting is terrible. And chatting is bad, and chatting wastes time, and they're not productive. And so you can see there could be different organization reactions. I don't know, I'm just guessing. But these are things that could be studied, I think, are publishing. Um, it 
So to do this, we have to have context. And we need to know what is the context. If you do a study of social media in organizations, but you don't say where it is, you don't identify the context, it's meaningless. Because I think social media use will be quite different in different contexts. So we need to have more information about context. So as to understand, so as to interpret. We have to protect the identity of people. You can't identify the names. You probably cannot identify the company. But you still have to tell something. This was a telecommunications company, this was a university, this was a steel manufacturer, whatever. There has to be some company. Now, back to relevance. There is relevant research, and a lot of the relevant research is in developing countries. If you look at the developing countries' literature, you will find examples of papers, and they identify. We studied the use of mobile phones by fishermen in West Africa. And we were looking for how to get the right price for fish, or farmers looking for selling their crops. And they're often very particular about the context. And that helps. And they look at which technology in which context for which purpose. And so the developing country literature we Alex referred to, we, we do look at context very carefully. Um, um, studies in organizations, the context is often quite clear. Studies with students, it's often not very clear because the researchers try to cover up. Kind. If it's organizational research, very often the context can be more clear. Uh, if the authors bother, if the editors bother, but some editors don't care either. Um, <coughs> if you do case studies, if you do action research, if you do ethnography, you need to be explicit about context. You need to identify who are we studying, why are we studying, what are we studying, how are we doing things. If you don't say those things, the case study has no meaning. So case studies often have quite a rich context that we can identify, that we can use. Um, a lot of my work is knowledge management in Chinese companies. And I will identify as much context as I can. Some of my work is in public relations. And public relations is about being public. So I said to the companies, I'm writing these papers, how should I call you? Please use our real names. Don't call us ABC. We don't want to be ABC. We want to be the real company name. Because we're, 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 we're public relations, right? Public means telling people what, who we are, what we do. So they actually saw the research as an opportunity to get PR for themselves. Um, so I would be very explicit. But I have, to, I have to protect the employees somehow. I can't identify individual employees. Um, I talked about the need for relevance, the need to have a question, the research question, the motivation, the objective, what we're trying to understand, what we're trying to achieve. Who is going to be interested? So there should be an audience. Somehow we have to identify which people are interested in the research. Not just you. Uh, I hope you're interested in the research, but if you're not, then you well. <laughs> you're just doing it because you hate it. But if you can identify who else is interested, that makes the motivation much stronger. That means that you're trying to persuade the editor, please publish my paper, because I think it's interesting for your readers. But how many journals are there? 50, 100, 200? Each journal is different. Each journal has a slightly different style, slightly different set of readers. So you need to know who are the readers that you're writing for. Who is the audience that you're writing for? Um, if you never read MIS quarterly, do not send them a paper. If you never read Information Systems Journal, do not send us a paper. Because you don't know what we publish. You need to be familiar 
with the kinds of papers that journal publishes before we send them something. So we know roughly what they're looking for. If journal A publishes papers which are 6,000 words long, do not send them 10,000 words. Because they will just reject it. If they publish big papers, then don't send them small papers. No. These are very simple things, but you have to fit what you're doing to what they're expecting. You need to have a theory. And the theory has to be reasonable. It has to be something that you can use, something that can guide the research. Um, I don't have time to talk in detail about theory. I could talk for three hours about theory. Um, but theory requires a lot of care. Think about which theory is applicable, is appropriate for a context and how to apply it, and how to measure things, and see whether the theory applies or does not. You get the wrong theory, you have problems. Uh, yeah. Two quotations. There is nothing so practical as a good theory. Good theories can help us, and point us in the right direction, and help us to organize where we think. And equally, I have to be very dangerous. Gauchal was writing about the economic problems, economic crisis. And he's saying, one reason we have an economic problem, now we do have subprime market, why do we have these problems? Because the people who make decisions got MBAs from MIT and Yale and Princeton and Harvard. And the MBA process is dangerous. It teaches them bad theories. It teaches them economic theories which maximize shareholder value but don't care about employment. So economic theories are very powerful drivers of value for some people, but they may be also very powerful destroyers of value for other people. They may put people in positions of making decisions about things that have huge consequences. So the, the, the bad theory can lead you in the wrong direction. Imagine that I'm doing research in a company and I'm using theory to suggest how the company should develop. Right? I make the wrong decision, the company can go bankrupt. I choose the wrong theory, it may be a problem. I hope I have insurance. <laughs> so when they insure me to see me to go bankrupt, I have some coverage. Um, so theory is something we have to look at, but again, I don't really have time to look at theory in detail here. Um, <coughs> let's get this one. This is a question I often get. I focus on relevance, and I focus on theory, and I focus on being ethical, and I don't focus all of my attention on reader. What's going to happen to my paper? Journals always ask for reader. Reviewers always ask for reader. If I look at relevance, they won't be impressed. Um, if I make my paper very revolutionary relevant in some of the context, no, but that's not enough. You have to be rigorous as well. You have to do both. And I think you can do both. You can do it well, but you can also do it in detail. Doing things rigorously does not mean they're not relevant. They can be relevant as well. Um, top journals reject a lot. But top journals do accept things. And the things they accept are quite good, usually. And I would say they're well done, and they're also useful if they are accepted. So during the revision process, it will become more rigorous, for sure. But it will hopefully also be more relevant and more, more, more consumable, more, more understandable. And that's part of the review process, that you have to achieve that through the review process. Um, if I was doing a workshop on publishing, which this is not, it would be three or six hours. 
and I would look at these in a lot more detail about how to do the revision process. And I, I, I do. I, I have a six-hour presentation on, on publishing. This is only a small part of it. Um, <coughs> you have to submit something that is good enough to have a chance to be published. That's the target. You're not trying to write something that is perfect, because you cannot, and I cannot. My papers get rejected as well, all the time. You have to write something that is good enough to get in the door. Good enough that the editors or the reviewers say, let's give them a second chance. Good enough that you can make progress. You're not looking to make it perfect. The review process will help you to make it better. It doesn't mean that you, you don't bother. You do as much as you can. But even when you do as much as you can, it's only 50%. And the reviewers will help you take it up to 80 or 90%. Doing it by yourself is just about impossible. Partly because you don't accept the paper. The reviewers and the editors are the ones who accept the paper. And they want you to produce something different to what you can imagine. But whatever you think, it won't be enough. They will always have something else to add. Uh, the paper which I published in MIS quarterly this year, it took us four years. We had to revise four times, five times. One of the authors is a top publisher in the US. Makes no difference. When we write our revision notes, the revision notes were 20,000 words. The paper is 20,000 and the revision notes are 20,000. I mean? they, they sent me 100 comments, 100 things to change on the first version, 100 new things on the second version. And then the third version was only 50. <laughs> only, only 50. So when I write my reply to those comments, the first version I had to write, we had to write 20,000 words of reply. So what have we done? What have we done to address one of the comments? It's that hard. There's no way to produce the perfect paper and they have nothing to say. It never happens. Reviewers always have something to say. And if they reject 90%, if they give you that chance, you're good enough to be in the maybe in the top. It's hard. On the first round, they reject 50. Half of papers are rejected on the first round. So if you get in, and you, they say revise and resubmit, get the champagne. <laughs> be really happy. Revise and resubmit is really good. Much better than reject. It means you have a chance. They give you 100 comments. It's going to take you two years. No problem. You want the paper, you're going to have to work. And you do everything they ask. You don't disagree. Everything they ask you do, properly, thoroughly, detailed. And then you send it back and they say, oh, well done. Some more things to change, but we're making progress. No guarantees. No guarantees, but we're making progress. You do everything they ask for again. And so on. So on the fourth round, the editor said, I think minor revisions, but a lot. It took another three months. So that's my experience of top journals. It can take three, four, five years. You have to be persistent. Don't give up. Uh, well, now I've got nothing to talk about. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, this one? Oh, yeah. no, this is easy. This was easy. Just enter. No, we have a problem here that it seems that if you don't touch the, it will very long. It will turn off. This is why I'm going I'm coming back here to revive this one. So there's a little bit more detail which I didn't put in the slides. Um, you have to think who is the research development for? Who is the audience? It has to be as broad as possible within reason. Um, you have to make it reasonably broad to attract attention. If, if the audience is very, very narrow, it's going to be quite a problem. 
Um, in developing countries, we don't worry so much about this. If it's interesting, then we will publish it. Uh, we, we publish a paper about farmers in West Africa. How many farmers are going to read the paper? No. That doesn't matter. Researchers will read it. It's mostly a research journal, very few practitioners. Um, but to me, if it's interesting, I'll publish it. I have no page limit, I have no budget. Mm. I can publish as much as I want. Mm. So that's the nice thing about an electronic journal. You can publish whatever you like. No, I'm the boss. Mm. No one can tell me not to publish. But in the mainstream, the print journals, the number of papers accepted is very, very low. I said 90%. In some journals, it's 95% projected. It's very, very hard to get out. Um, but it's good for your career, yeah? it's good for your promotion, good for your next job, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we do these things because we have no choice. Um, why do they reject so much? Because we get so many submissions. It's a very simple reason. And they have page budgets. They have page, how many pages we can publish per year. So I don't know for other journals, but for Information Systems Journal, we publish six issues a year, and we have a page budget of 576 pages, journal pages, a year. I accept too much, then the authors will have to wait and wait and wait for their paper to come out, because I have a limit of pages a year. If I don't accept enough, I'm in trouble, because if the journal is due out next week, we have nothing to publish. Then I have a problem. So we have to balance how to publish the right amount. Information systems journal, we get probably 500 submissions a year. My next quarterly gets over a thousand a year. There's a lot of submissions. Every submission has to be read by a senior editor, by an associate editor, by two, three reviewers. It's a lot of time. Um, but if the paper is not suitable, it's not well written, it's not rigorous, it's not relevant, the editor will reject it. They won't waste the time with reviewers. They'll say, not interesting, go, too light, reject. And we don't want that. So you have to read the kind of things they publish. You have to make sure that when you write the paper, you cite that journal. How is what you're doing relevant to what they've published already? How are you contributing to the conversation? How are you contributing to this stream of research? You go to a top journal and you cite all the other top journals, but not this one. You're asking for trouble. You send to MISQ, but you don't cite MISQ, that means you show them no respect. So they pay attention to this. Of course, if MISQ rejects your paper, then you send it to journal B or journal C, you have to change the references. If you send to journal B with journal A's references, it's not going to like it. Journals are very sensitive to this. Editors are sensitive to this. We're particularly sensitive to papers published in the last two years, because they contribute to impact. You know what is impact? Mm -hmm. okay, but it's calculated by how many papers published in the last two years are published in this, are cited in this, um, published here. So all stuff is in count. Just the, so for, for this year's impact factor, the 2012 and 13 papers which are being cited will count. So citing recently published papers will be happy about. Um, hmm, now I'm talking about you. It's very common to send your paper from the best journal you can think of. You know it might get rejected, but you want feedback. Unfortunately, the feedback might be not suitable, bye bye. And that's it. You don't get the feedback at all. Um, most papers are rejected. Many are rejected without being reviewed if they're not nervous, if they're not suitable, if they're not in the scope. They're not in the right field. Um, and as I say, authors seem more concerned with publishing, less concerned about the reading. 
I, I, I talk to some of my students in Hong Kong, and I don't care who reads it as long as somebody publishes it. I don't care, well, why not? I, don't, I just have to publish it. I can get my PhD, but I can even get a job. But, but, but why don't you care if someone reads it? It doesn't matter, does it? I mean, it's just one line on my CD. It's a very pragmatic approach, but I think it's wrong. Because if you don't care about who's going to read it, then nobody will publish it. And if you don't care about who you're writing for, then that will be very visible in the writing. If you do things in a very mechanical way, and just follow the steps one by one and follow the procedures, but there's no personal motivation or flavor or style, it's not interesting to read. It's very well done, but it's not interesting. So somehow you have to allow your personal passion. I hope you have a passion for research. That's why we're here, right? We're here for a different reason. But your passion should come through in On the right holiday. Way. Right? On a holiday. <laughs> On a holiday as well, that's right. And I had to pay for it. Yep. So if I don't have passion, there's something wrong here. That, that passion somehow has to come through the writing. Now, in a second language, it's hard. I know it's hard. And so one solution is you have to have a co-author who's writing in a first language. That's one way of doing it, is to find a new allow. Maybe that person's job is to do the writing, or at least to make the writing more passionate and more motivating and more interesting. That's possible. Um, you could send your paper to an external person before you submit. Say, I wrote this paper, but I'd like some, what do you think about it? Get some feedback from me or somebody else. That might help. But still, the paper is your paper. The words are your words. And somehow, the words have to come over in a way to persuade the reader or the editor that this is interesting. Uh, some people can do this, but actually, some native speakers cannot do this. So it's not only about first language or second language. Some first language people write in a really boring way, and some second language people write in a really interesting way. So I think it's a skill that you have to try and develop, and maybe you have to identify who are the really interesting researchers. And then go and read their stuff and try to see if you can learn their style or learn how they make them get um, Editors, editors want interesting things. They want things well done. They often want things to be relevant, relevant to a particular audience. They want things to be consumable. They want things to be citable. Because if the paper is cited, it will help the journal impact factor. It will help the journal's reputation. If, if nobody reads the paper, no one cites the paper, there's no point publishing it. It's just a waste of paper. So editors are not just looking for, for rigor only. They're looking for something that people will read and cite. <laughs> They're looking for something different. Something that's just the same as everything else is not likely to be so popular. Something that is radical, something that is creating a new ground, a new area, something that is criticizing previous work, has the potential to be cited. So just like your, I will say, your anti-tan, it's different. It's in a sense, it's criticizing or, or critiquing some parts of previous research. That creates an opportunity, not a guarantee, the opportunity. But maybe you could create a paper which creates a new direction of time research. So I use this social media example already, but I see more and more social media in companies. Sometimes formal, sometimes informal. Sometimes there is a strategy for social media, and sometimes there's nothing, it's just chaos. But I think social media is so common, and I don't think it's going to go away. It's here. 
it may get worse, it may not get better. We may have more of it, not less. But how organizations respond to social media, how they leverage, how they use, how they take advantage of social media, I think there's a lot of research to be done. We don't really understand it because it's still relatively new. <laughs> I've done a few papers on this. I've looked at social media and interruption. You're working and then on your screen you have people sending messages all the time. Is that interrupting your work? Some people would say yes, and then you're less productive. Others would say, it's just normal. It's just what happens. You live with it. There was a study in America of if somebody rings you in your office on the telephone, <coughs> And you pick up the phone and you listen and you put it down, how long does it take to concentrate on your work? They found 15 minutes. minutes. Social media does not get any work at all. <laughs> I mean, it's every two, every five seconds. So, yes, it is interruptive, but it doesn't matter. Because this is normal, this is life. For this particular generation of people, just what they're used to. Um, and so I think there should be topics in social media which we could identify. And it would be interesting to look at Brazilian culture, working culture, social culture, friends culture, I don't know what. And see how people do things. Maybe you don't know either. Go and ask your kids. Go and study what do people do in organizations. Go and look at MBA class. Because many of them are working. The teaching MBA even better. They will do a study of your MBA students. See if you can do a case study in one of their organizations if they're working. Theory. There are lots of theories about social interaction and social exchange and social networking. There's also theories about knowledge sharing, theories about sociology, theories of communication. Lots of possible theories that you could use. Um, do you, there is an IS theory website in the US. Search for IS theory, you will find a website at BYU, Brigham Young University. It lists about 80 theories as a, as, a, as a wiki. You can click each theory and it will give you an explanation of who was using it and what are the main constructs and so on. Go have a look at this. It's a useful resource. <laughs> I think we have enough time to study social media. <laughs> so please do not use time to study social media. It's boring. I promise I will not publish this. We get so many time papers submitted, and they all tell us nothing new. It's one more verification. I think replication is good. We need to replicate, but not forever. Sometimes we have to say, enough. Let's do something different. Anti tap, maybe. We can have matter or anti matter, we can have tap and anti tap. Um, I think an anti tap study would be fine. Um, we have to find a different theoretical perspective of whatever topic. Um, social media, again, it's about use and adoption, yes, but it's also about power. And who has the power to use it and doesn't have the power to use it? It's about resistance, perhaps. It's about inclusion or exclusion. Um, Louise Joy, who is not here, unfortunately, and I, we're writing a panel for ISIS for the author. And we're looking at social media in organizations. And I see some organizations which are very pro social media, and they have a very inclusive, bring everybody in. But I also see places where it's exclusive. If you don't use social media, then you are excluded. And many people say, these days everyone uses Facebook. They don't. I don't want to use Facebook. I don't want to use Twitter. I don't have the time. I don't have any, so I use LinkedIn, that's all. 
That's it, I need, but nothing else. To me, it's an invasion of privacy. And yet, for many people, it's not. My mom uses it. My daughter uses it. But I don't. I don't want to share plugins with everyone. Um, but then I'm one of the minorities. So now I'm the dinosaur. I'm excluded from all of those groups which use it. And so we can take an inclusion exclusion perspective for different technologies. Um, I say here for digital natives, people who grew up with the internet. Social media is a part of their brain, just who they are. You can't separate them. Mm -hmm. they, they go into mental hospital and keep it over. Mm -hmm. They are, it's not just addictive, they are dependent. Maybe I'm talking to the right people. Mm -hmm. We are go dependent. But for the digital dinosaurs, the ones who are now in their 50s or 60s or 70s, and they when they grew up, there was no internet. And when they went to university, there was no internet. And when they went to work, there was no internet. And maybe they started using email recently, but nothing else. These, there are many of these people still running companies. Many CEOs are dinosaurs. And they have a problem. Recently, I was doing a study of hotels in China, looking at how hotels use IT for knowledge sharing, for problem solving, for communication. And the junior employees, they all use MSN and uh, email is dinosaur. Email is not old. What do you mean old? All the 25. <laughs> but that's a, that's a very young perspective. Of course, as they get older, the older will also get older. But the CEO is probably the sixth. And the, and the VP for IT does not use social media. VP in headquarters for IT, it's a global chain, like 4,000 hotels around the world. Very anti technology. In hotel bandwidth is very low. Many applications are blocked. Employees cannot do this. I talked to a VP and he said, I know social media is part of social life, it has no role in organization. organization. Just chance. Just wait. And this is a very common attitude, particularly for the dinosaurs. And they haven't, they haven't overcome. Maybe they won't. We just have to wait till they die. And in between the natives and the dinosaurs, we had the immigrants, the digital immigrants. When they grew up, there wasn't any, but they've come to it later. And I would think most people in this room are in the immigrant category. Some of the younger ones might not be, but. Digital native normally will be born after 1990, 1995. Before 1990, we could be immigrants. Before 1950, perhaps, we These are not absolute numbers. Rough idea. One, two, three. All these very secure passwords. <laughs> <laughs> nice to know that you know how to stop the NSA from watching. <laughs> you worried about the NSA in Brazil? Is there an equivalent? There are Brazilian intelligence something. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it is it researchable? Is social attitudes towards it researchable? People won't talk. They, or they don't have an opinion. I think professors discuss that a lot. Because right? this is because like in a way, this is big data. Well, it's an application of big data. And I, I'm beginning to see studies in big data looking at security and privacy. And I expect there will be research about this. Maybe not here, but in some cases there will be research about this. And that's a, that's a totally new area. Which we, no, no journal papers yet. Conference papers, yes, because there are conferences on security, conferences on homeland security. Right. 
Conferences like ISIS and ISIS will run workshops. And the workshop will be attended by editors from the journals, and they will set up circular tables. And they will have two editors and six or seven authors to sit down, let's discuss your paper. So I go to these kinds of workshops. So I can talk to authors directly, and the authors can bring their questions, can bring their problems, can bring their ideas. We have a discussion as a workshop. And that is a good thing to do. If you see this kind of workshop, if you know you're going to the conference, try to go to the workshops. Send your paper, because this way you get lots of feedback from editors. But it's in a very safe environment. If they don't like it, it doesn't matter. You will still learn something. Maybe it's not suitable for this journal, but the feedback means you can make it better, you can send it to a different journal. And for your future, I like conferences. I suggest you do this. Mm -hmm. But we have a two hour session where you have one or two editors or senior professors who can talk to authors about their papers. You have to submit the paper in advance. But this way, you can get something much more practical. When you do a presentation, you get a few questions. But it's not the same. Because the questions are either asking for clarification or they disagree with you. That challenge you. But in a workshop, it's more constructive, more helping you to make your paper better. And that can be very useful. Um, so, we didn't schedule this kind of workshop here, but I'm very happy to give this kind of feedback later tomorrow. If you have to send me something, quick, in English. Why don't we watch it this And it depends who's interested, it depends how many people are interested, it depends what you send me. But I'm sure we could find time later this afternoon or tomorrow or something in the daytime. I'm flying tomorrow at 10 to 8. So I've got the whole day already. So I'll be happy to spend time to talk to anybody who's interested to talk about the title or a problem or a book paper or whatever. The opportunity is for you. And you have to think what to put in um, I will give you a name card now that you can find it. Um, 
I'm, I'm still in one X or whatever. I, I can create an opinion <laughs> about the loss of it. Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe you, you, you should still stay there uh, oh, okay. because people will have questions yes. here from the room. And uh, sure. if, anyone, if anyone there uh, is not uh, physically here with us also has questions, you, you, you can either write it down in our chat session and I, I can uh, translate or, 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 or read to Robert here. Uh, or otherwise, uh, if you put your hands up, I think I can also uh, have your, uh, a microphone for you if you have uh, the, the technical facility at the other side. Okay, so feel free. I have something. Okay. Please, please, please. Okay. Uh, so please don't be uh, sad or mad with some comments I would like to, to make. Uh, but I, uh, it's important also uh, for us to, to, tell, to tell you something about us. Yes. For example, yes. when you say uh, uh, four years discussing with a editor, with an editor, uh, for, uh, in order to have uh, two or uh, there uh, were still before that four years of research. Yes, so exactly. So it's a ten year, eight year, uh, six year, ten year process. Yeah, to some extent, but the four-year review process is not just answering, it's actually doing it's the research, better. it's the research yeah. as well. Yes, yeah. but it's still, it's a time it is you time. need to have. I agree. agree. And uh, in Brazil, uh, we do not have 10 years, six years, to stay uh, good, to stay. That's a problem of endurance. We have many other activities and here yes. the university has us a, a lot of other activities and, uh, we are not fully dedicated to, to the test. Yes. I, 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 I accept that. In Hong Kong it's the same. Also I cannot spend 10 years on one day. So what I do is I write multiple papers at the same time. Yeah. And I send some here, I send some here, I yeah. send some here. So that there will be something coming. That's one point. Uh, another one is about, uh, about what could be interesting. Like for example, and that's a, um, I don't know how to say, but let's say Brazil could be interesting because we are a great town with different cultures, and uh, but we are still one town. Compared, compared to Europe, there are, uh, I don't know, 20, I don't know, what's it called? Yeah, yeah, 30, I don't know. And uh, they, 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 not, they, they do not arrive to, to an agreement to work as an integrated. Yeah. So, it could, it could be interesting. Okay. Europe could learn something from us, but, but, our country is going like that, you know, but it's not uh, stable. We cannot, uh, we can, we cannot uh, hope that our experience could be some, some reference to, to them. Mm -hmm. But then, is banking, that yes. Banking, yes. Uh, public health system, yes. Public okay. service. So, uh, to, to say, yeah, to vote the elections? Yes. Uh, in, in let's let's yeah. say yes, but there are big doubts about the, uh, the, the, the state of the procedures, the spirit of the procedures. But it's integrated, it's wide. So we should pick uh, fields or contexts like that to try to to say something to the world. So one way is to do a cross cultural study. You do Brazil on one side, and you do somewhere in Europe on the other side, and you compare their experiences. But our budgets are really too tiny compared to, to, to do some studies. Why? It doesn't cost anything. Uh -huh. Why does it have to cost? It has to cost email costs. You, you don't have to fly there. You need to have a researcher in Europe 
as a colleague. I think you, if you ask for a reward, you, you have to control the, the no, so, so I think one of the problems we have in this is yeah, you, you need to have a colleague there. You only have a colleague there after you go to the meetings yeah. several times and uh, yeah. so yeah. meet them. Yeah. To really understand the other person. Well, it's interesting because I have colleagues I've never met. I've written papers with people, but I've never met them. Yeah, but, but uh, that's a, there could be a fragility in your study. There is a consider, consider regarding rigor. Yes. 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 And Robert, and there is uh, something else there that may happen is that you, are, as, as an English speaker, mm -hmm. uh, you may be that second author that people are looking for. Well, he's someone who can yeah. give my good ideas on, my, on a, a nice paper. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a disadvantage that we have. No one wants to have a paper well written in Portuguese, uh, you know. Uh, so, you understand that? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that another, another thing I wrote here is. If I pick your example from India, I would say to the guy, uh, let's uh, study uh, how we do uh, deal with this situation. So no electricity and so on. But it would be interesting for for whom? Because their their problem could be uh, so it's to study their problem could be something interesting. But for whom? Not for the developer. What? Then a study about America is interesting for who? Americans. Is it interesting for anybody else? The world is quite uh, dominated for them. Yes, but that doesn't mean Europe, uh, Japan, yeah. Europe, United States. Um, most of the IS journals will publish good papers about anyway. Most of the research is about America because most authors are American. And America has more universities, more resources, and more papers. True. But I don't think there is a bias against India or against Brazil. Brazil. No, I don't think there's a bias. And so if you can write a good paper, I think you have an equal chance. That's my feeling. Because I've seen good papers by authors in India published in good journals. It is possible. But, but maybe it's about confidence as well. Uh, I have another kind of question I'd like to um, but I need to explain a little bit more. I hope I will be here. Context is something uh, so, uh, all the time context is important. Mm. So, as uh, educators, uh, as uh, professors mm -hmm. who need to supervise to guide other students, doctoral or master mm -hmm. students, uh, I see context as a challenge that we need to formalize after the method. But the students, because the students need, uh, need to, at first, to define Problem, pick some theories, then to, to elaborate some way conceptual models to merge the theories to a conceptual model, and then and then tell us how you you manage or conduct that, and then you pick the context. Because because they need to be able at first to tell us let's take uh, decision making the decision making not decision making problem okay can be a uh, can be uh, let's say uh, study many ways different ways but I can study that in an industry post uh, different kind of context. What I understood is one thing is to conduct a, to guide the students their research. Therefore, another thing is I will take this experience to write a paper. So the paper I will tell since the beginning uh, decision making for or not in South of Brazil. Yeah. I will set the context since the beginning. But I will not think about the context. 
uh, I, I want to approach the process before before um, that obsession. How you see it? Well, there is a risk. Because if you have a very good literature, you have a very good model, you have a good understanding of theory, you have a good method, but then you have no context. Because you cannot find a suitable context for what you want to do. Is there a risk that you are wasting time? Because you do all this work, but then, but then you can't collect data. Because there is no context where you can validate the model. If you do have the context, at least in the mind, yeah. at the beginning, that's good. If you have, we, we could ask this or this or this. We, we decide later, but at least we have some idea about what the context could be. So I need him to be able, theoretically, yeah. to elaborate something theoretically. Theoretically, but also practically. From a certain oh. point. Oh. I, a lot of PhD students in Hong Kong do not study organizations. They study students. Yeah. And the research is very, very hard to publish. Some journals now will say, if you use students as proxies, we will not publish. You say the students are pretending to be managers. Nonsense. Students cannot pretend to be managers because managers have different pressure, different culture, different style, different salary. <coughs> it's not realistic. It's very experimentally controlled, yes. It's very rigorous. But the relevance is zero. And, and journals have a problem. So I'm speaking as an editor about the we want to publish relevant research. We want to publish rigorous as well. But if we leave the context too late, then it may be very hard to find a suitable context. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the risk. So if you have a context at the beginning, I think that can help to protect you. But how to do that, I'm not sure. It depends on your context. Yeah, my, my concern is that if you create data a student, to do so since the beginning, verified yes. uh, the context, May at the end be a good guy for this context, this kind of context, uh, but not be able to read the, 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 the day after I, I challenge him to integrate another team with another kind of context, and he will have problems yes. because he is not educated to to reason about the I don't know what kind of problem. But it's interesting, you say not educated. What kind of courses do you offer to PhD students? I discuss about the research methods. But did, you, you just want to one discussion? No. They have they take classes. Yes, they have ten students. Okay. On yeah. um, the doctor and master students. Oh, but I I follow them. I I enjoy very much getting uh, would somebody else like to do it? Oh, we were we're trying to, to see if the technology worked here. And, and his camera appeared there, but for some reason, uh, his camera is not going. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. didn't help. Yeah. 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 I'm going to try and yeah, have a second yeah, yeah, camera yeah. there, yeah. but this camera is not good. Yeah. It's just, I mean, if anyone is uh, somewhere else and, and wants to have a question, please, uh, I, I yeah. want you to thank you, Robert, for your speech, um, for our presentation. Yeah. I already submitted some papers to some top journals, including yours, uh, uh, I submitted to them as quarterly. I was doing a group and organization management, which is an organization studies journal. And I received many very, very good pieces, uh, yours, I think. Um, but sometimes I feel that I'm getting towards the viewers. 
but we look more for problems than for virtues. Absolutely. In, in, Absolutely. In, in a paper. In, in, uh, in, uh, yeah, you, you, you can confirm that. I will. Okay. It, it's a big problem with the review process. We are very good looking for problems. We're very bad at looking for good things. But I'm currently more interested in uh, providing journals with um, relevant papers or practice. Okay. Uh, although we research according to uh, rigorous demands of uh, on knowledge and so on. But when I uh, finish a paper, uh, I try to highlight the, the virtues for uh, uh, but I, I do not think that I compromise the theoretical discussion. Uh, I, I still didn't find the, 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 the right mix of, I, I think that I didn't find because the, the, the feedbacks from the top journals are almost always the same. Uh, expressing the problems, asking for a major revision, a new situation. But um, it's not always that I can fully agree with those feedbacks. It happens to me as well. I get the same, I get the projected, I get major revisions, and I get. Change, 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 I also don't like this. But then, as I said, I'm not accepting my own paper. And you're not accepting your paper. <laughs> so, unfortunately, you have to do what the reviewer is asked for. If you want to argue, you can. You don't have to do everything they ask for. But you have to have very good arguments to try and persuade them or to persuade the editor. Um, this is this is the system. Uh, I don't see a solution which will satisfy the problem. Um, it is it is what, what you do need to have is a sympathetic senior editor. That's very important. Senior editor is sympathetic. You have a chance. Because they will be reasonable. If they're not sympathetic, you have no chance. I have no chance. And I have had feedback from an editor who told me, if you do it my way, I will consider the paper. If you do it your way, I will never consider the paper. I believe that was very effective. Let me tell you all <laughs> one thing that can see. You're being required. <laughs> no problem. Unless you're there. The same paper that I submitted when yeah, I asked you yeah. in 2011, uh, which received a, a, a very good feedback that helped me improve the paper and the movement in publishing the third tier uh, This very same paper I submitted to. Another journal, oh, whose name is <laughs> <laughs> not no, no, no. You're really <laughs> <not close. laughs> and, and the feedback was in one line by email from the editor, uh, whose name I will also not disclose. Um, your paper do not, it does not stand on its own feet. That's it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there are very nice things. <laughs> Sympathetic. It's not constructive. It's not right. Let it try it. <laughs> um, I, I sent a paper to JMIS once, and I got a one line rejection from the editor. And the editor is the same editor now as he was then. And my paper was about action research. And he said, Action research is not research. End of story. And so, so some editors have very, very uh, inflexible attitude to things they don't like. And the, the only thing to do is go somewhere else. The only thing you can do. Okay.
I have a lot of questions. You said that you have to be perseverance, but after you talk about rigor and relevance, isn't being perseverance uh, just the rigorous and forget the relevance? Because if you're going to have to wait for three years or so to get uh, published, or even more than that, aren't you, you know, giving up relevance? Oh yes, because the part is not published if you have a and besides, I mean, you put so much effort there, you could, have, you, you could be putting effort into something, into something else. Uh, and, uh, that would already be more profitable. You know, to society, to whoever you are, to, to the community. Uh, what, what I'm saying is, uh, as editors, uh, shouldn't we be considering getting closer and allowing uh, more that the researchers express themselves? Uh, uh, and, and, and then get uh, you, you know, get the feedback, check, check, check what other what other uh, other researchers have, uh, or other researchers' opinions about that. And you know, I, I mean, we're competing with the web now, and uh, some people are referring to you know, not bother with the journals any longer, and just publishing on the web. And Google Scholar will do it. You know, if he decides it, he will. What's your opinion about that? No, I, I agree. I think we need to let the market. The market likes the paper, people will download it from Google Sites. If the market doesn't like it, then they'll really read it from the Google Sites. That's fine. With e journals, that's not a problem. Because e journals have no limits on paper. For paper based journals, it's not quite so easy. Because the editor has a responsibility to publish papers which will be cited, and the publisher cares. It's because actually, the editor is not the boss, the publisher is the boss. And so they want to publish things that the publisher will see being cited and will enhance the reputation of the film. That means that the editor is looking for some kinds of papers and some kind of quality and some kind of rigor. And that's why we have to go through this process. Is it worth it? It depends on really. If it's not worth it, you don't have to do it. You can always decide not to do it. Um, for myself, normally I am writing between six and ten papers at one time. Some I'm writing, some are under review, some are being revised. It takes a lot of time. And maybe we don't have the time to do ten. Or maybe our brains don't have enough room to do ten. Uh, but if you only did one, I think that's too risky. You, you, at least you have to have two or three. Because you don't work on all at the same time. One is being revision, revised, okay. one is being reviewed, that will take six months. Nothing happens for six months. Another one is just some ideas, which I'm, I'm not the first author, I'm the third author, somebody else is the third author. But then if you have more papers at different stages, yeah. some will be rejected and you have to try again. Some will be accepted. And so then you will create a sequence of papers which will add to your CV, you will add to your website. Um, maybe 10 is too many. Uh, but of those 10, I think half will be rejected. And I'll have to do something else. I'm very realistic about it. I have some papers I have never been able to publish. I love the papers, but I can't publish them. I can put them on my website. Yeah, I could. But to bring the original aesthetic of the paper, because when they submit the paper, they ask us, is it original? For one, for one period of time, we publish our own papers like that, and then uh, writing in the beginning, submitted to the journal AIS. Yeah. 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 But uh, oh. after it's, it's, it's not accepted, we have to save the paper online. Well, you could not only put the paper, but you could put the reviews online. You put the decision online, and then put your comments on the reviews. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, these stupid reviewers, and the stupid things they say, and, and make it visible. You know, say, this was a JNIS review. Look at this stupid journal. You can do that and if you're really annoyed. <laughs> but for, if it's always the same journal, it's enough. It's just one. <laughs> yes. All right. Any uh, questions? We're running a little uh, late, but I think it's, it, it's very good to, and considering that it's, uh, it's a clock that's really 20,000 kilometers.
So we're looking at that year, and, and another 20 dollars. Half the world to come here, half the world to go back. I think it's worth that we are a little late. We will uh, take a short break. In five minutes, there's some coffee outside. Uh, and after that, we will go on with, the, with the, our program. As I, are you seeing it in your screens? OK. Uh, so we, we are maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes uh, late. Uh, for those who are at home, yeah, have a coffee. We'll be back in five minutes. Thanks, Robert. Thank you very much.